now you're done with your degree and now all of a sudden like the letters just come rolling in success is abundant and easy and now uh, now all of life's dreams come true what helped you decide to go to graduate why did you decide to go to graduate school and kind of how did that process take shape in your life i think that we're always fighting between two different desires which one is to make money because you have to you have to make money to live and the other is to find something to do with your life that's fulfilling and those are constantly in conflict and if you love accounting and that is your life's passion and you find fulfillment in it and you can make some money doing accounting, great. You can't deny what you're attracted to. You know, you just can't deny what presents itself as being interesting and important and moving in your life. That doesn't mean you have to do music because we can have several of those things. But for me, it, that's, that's what it meant. And I don't think I even knew that until I committed to it wholly. Um, I decided to go to graduate school before I even started my undergrad in music because I'm not a do things halfway person. I wasn't going to school to just kind of see maybe if I liked this or that. It was like, I'm good at this, I'm doing it. And uh, making the choice was more important to me than anything else, even with all the troubles that come with it. And you can't escape them no matter what you choose, truly. Anyone who tells you you can is lying or trying to sell you something. Um, there's, a, there's a crap sandwich that comes with every, every path. So music was fulfilling for me. I couldn't escape it. I already had a degree in psychology, family psychology, and, and uh, it was undeniable. I had to do it. So from the first day, my first voice lesson ever at 25, I knew I was going to go to grad school because you can't be competitive as a credible authority in any field without furthering education and knowing as much as you can about it. So that's what I decided to do, and um, I was serious, I was in it, I was committed, I was determined to show up and try to become the person that others could rely on, a person of authority, a person who understood, who could articulate her thoughts, who could talk about the business of music and the theory and the history of it with a lot of um, authority. And... Uh, that gives you respect and it makes people trust you and it makes people give you opportunities you wouldn't otherwise have. And if you think those two aren't linked, you are not viewing the world properly because they are definitely linked, your behavior and opportunities. And the more opportunities you get and the more you attack them with every ounce of courage you have, the more you get. So the more, the better I did, the more opportunities I got because I was showing that I had credibility and that I was consistent in my behavior. People could rely on me to do things. So I went to graduate school and graduate school for me, especially in music, is all about exposure. It's about giving yourself the last little bits of polish and exposure is the big one. So when I was looking for grad schools to go to, I was looking for a place that, that wouldn't necessarily focus so much on the academic papers and, you know, writing about what that dominant seventh chord meant in that German art song. Like, that's, that was not where I wanted to go. Other people do, so they chose places that were a little more academic. Yale was, was really important to me because they pay for your whole schooling, thank the Lord. So I, I, I applied to Yale and because I knew that they didn't mess around with a lot of the academic stuff. You know, you guys know. Like this, the stuff that you're just like, I have to do this because it's an important part of, of my education. I have to know it. The reason I have to know it is because you can't go around and talk about music with authority. Like I've used that word so many times, but you can't talk about it with authority unless you take those classes. That doesn't mean they were all super interesting to me necessarily. It just meant that I, I had a vested interest in being the best. And so I needed to know it. And I do. And, um... So they gave me performance opportunities when I graduated from Yale. I had nine full operas under my belt, and I have friends who went to Rice, which is a very competitive music school, who did a couple of scenes, and that's it. 
but I have the full role, the full opera. I have gone through the whole thing and done it over and over and over and worked with great coaches and my teachers had connection to people in New York and people at the Met and people on Broadway and I met so many people and connection is, it's just you've got to know the right people. <laughs> so they yeah, gave me that. You, you started, uh, you know, in your undergraduate, um, you got like a, <clears throat> a, a glimpse of some of those connections, a glimpse of some of like you, you, you had roles in operas, um, but, but you know, much like our students here at UAFS, um, maybe you didn't have an entire opera or you had a scene that you were you know involved in, and that's just the glimpse. I mean, yeah. uh, master's degree or graduate work really gives you the whole picture, um, extends that experience so that you can become. Uh, a substantial um, academic and knowledgeable person in your field. True, and it didn't just start there, Tim. You know, when I went into music, I knew I wanted to get the role so that I had a chance of being accepted at a school like Yale or a school like Rice or Northwestern or any other place I wanted to go. And that meant that I needed the experience. I needed to show that I'd been on stage. I understand what it feels like to sing with an orchestra and the complications that arise from that kind of partnership. It's a difficult thing and to have that put on my shoulders and to have gotten through it successfully, I was able to take clips from it and send it to them so they knew I'd done it. They knew I'd worn those horrible corsets and the 70 pound dress and I had sung successfully and I had video footage of it. But it started my first year. There's no way they were going to give me a lead role in The Magic Flute until I showed I could be trusted with it. And that meant that I went and did the chorus part and I dressed up like one of the animals in the magic part. I had to wear a big old deer like head and everything. It was not my favorite. It was the worst 70 pound dress. I'm exaggerating. It was probably like it was probably around 45 or 50 pounds. It was heavy. And yes, it was, it was tough. The, the networking side of it, like I, I can relate to that because in my own journey, uh, when I chose uh, doctoral school, um, I was all about the networking. So for me, for those who don't know, my undergraduate is also where I did my master's degree. So I stayed at the same school, which is actually something they don't recommend. But the reason yeah. I did it was because there was a mentor there who um, is world famous and if you don't know the works of the collected works of Eric Whitaker, my mentor was invited by Eric Whitaker himself to to make the CD of his collected works. It's the first one that was made. Since then, Eric Whitaker himself and his own group has has made this this CD. But but you know, it was time, us first. You know, he was like he was like the Eric Whitaker was like nobody does my music like you do. So yeah. and and I took that as a not just Eric Whitaker, but for a whole host of reasons, I took, uh, you know, the worth of that mentor as more than any other um, potential graduate school could offer me. So I decided to stay and, and get that master's degree from him. And then I did take off. So I think there are that, but that's part of the networking, right? You know, the worth of someone of a connection uh, is what you're looking for. And, um, when I looked at doctoral schools, I started more of the mindset of what Emily is talking about here, where um, now I was looking for schools that could potentially help me network, and the University of Texas at Austin was, was easy yeah. in that realm. So, but I um, think too, Tim, you, you, we all know that these things don't matter if you're not exceptional at what you do. And you can't do that unless you have a teacher that you really trust. And so, I mean, while connection is so important and we we both agree about that, in my mind, if I didn't have a teacher that I felt I, would make me a good singer, no one would care where I went to school if I wasn't great. I could have gone to Yale and be a terrible singer and I still would not get work. So it really, the combination of the two only helps you, but you have to be good you have to work and you have to do all the all the necessary sacrificing for sure so now now you're done with your degree and now all of a sudden like the letters just come rolling in success is abundant and <laughs> easy and now <laughs> uh, now all of life's dreams come true talk to me talk to me what happened after you're done 
Uh, then all the auditions start. And again, people don't like to trust you unless you have a track record. Unless they know that you've done a lot of shows and you can be relied upon to do, to do the work. I mean, imagine, imagine you guys, like you, somebody has come to you in your current state and said, we need you to, somebody dropped out of our Scarlet Pimpernel on Broadway. And we know you're in a music program, we're desperate, say all cell phone service died so they can't go call the person across the world that they know could do the role, but you're right there. And they say, could you come and fill in for the part of Marguerite in the musical The Scarlet Pimpernel? It's in, we open in two weeks, rehearsals start in a week. Could you take that score and learn it, memorize it, and come prepared to block the show in about two days? Tech three days before, you're on in less than two weeks. Could you do that? And if you don't say yes, then you have some work to do. Because yeah, that's a real tight squeeze right there. But the reason that you're in your undergrad right now is so you can develop the skills so that when something like that comes up, you're fast. So when you're like, what's the point of this sight singing class? It's like that, that's the point. And when you're doing choir and you're like, oh, I'm having to, uh, why won't he just play my notes? Or I, you guys are never like that, I'm sure. Why won't he just play my notes for me? And you're just allowing yourselves to be led like baby birds. You know, it's like the reason is to hone your skills so that you can be relied upon to actually come and do your work. It's work. And yes, it's fulfilling and I love it and I wouldn't want to do anything else because it gives me fulfillment like nothing else could and that's just my own life. I need both for, for to justify the struggle and the suffering that life is. It just comes with it. And without something to make it worthwhile and justify that pain, what is the point? You see what I mean? Like I've got to have something that makes it worthwhile. And to me, that's music. And that means that if I'm gonna make less than $65,000 a year, that's not how much I make, I'm not telling you that. But if I'm gonna make 65,000 or less, I can be happy as hell. And yes, I'm swearing, because that is fulfilling to me. So the priorities can be really skewed when people come into music and they go, but I'm not, how do I make money? Yeah, that's really important. but check yourself are you do you want to be a millionaire do you have any idea what that takes you know what i mean and with the kind of work that you're putting in be really honest with yourself is that something that you you have a right to that you deserve we really have to be humble i have several side businesses i know that dr workman does too there's no shame in that i enjoy it i enjoy the work um several of my friends who's graduated from school have a few of them I think two of them work at Google and then uh, I have another one who's a recruiter for Facebook and he graduated from Yale with me great singer music doesn't have to you don't have to do either or and that's something that I, I just hate when people think they have to pick one or the other no 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 I don't know how many people have done an undergrad in music and then gone on to be lawyers law schools love when you have some other kind of, of field that you've studied they love it you guys aren't just learning music you're learning how to be reliable you're learning how, my gosh you're singing in front of people like you have speaking skills like nobody else would because you understand anxiety you understand how to structure a performance of sorts you have so many skills that are valuable to especially tech companies because you have those soft skills those interpersonal relationships um, are easy for you to grasp and understand uh, how to talk to their customers how to um, make people feel safe and like you're taking care of their needs. These are all things that kind of innately come with us as musicians and artists. So don't get stuck in the trap of thinking that you have to pick either or, or that if I do an undergrad in music that that's all I have to do. Gosh, you could do anything. You could go on and do something in tech. You could go and do something in masters with music. You could do so many things. It's really the world is your, is your oyster. I love it. And you know, everybody, this right now constitutes a networking opportunity. Emily is now in your field of view. She, she has her connections, and her connections are different than my connections. Yeah. And I will also say, you know, join her Instagram. Go and if you're interested in anything she has to say today, if you feel like it, it relates to you and it, and it works for you, join her Instagram, go join her YouTube channel she 
posts videos about her experiences. She t talks about vocal techniques. She she has a whole host of even she has different video channels because she's like like she says she's doing so many things on the side. Um, but uh, you know, maintain that connection uh, is a big part of, of the networking side of it. Um, yeah. I can't remember. Uh, who it was that told me was one of my mentors, my undergraduate. If you meet somebody that's important to you, thanks, Jenny. <laughs> and then next day, email them. Email yeah. them and you know, uh, say, hey, it was fun to get to know you. It was it was awesome to, to talk to you yesterday. That's it. Just one little extra step to say what you know. My meeting with you was meaningful. And if yeah. you don't do that for Emily today, at least learn that process and start that process now. Emily, I would love to talk to you about a little bit about some of the more uh, digital aspects of what you're doing in your life right now, because part of this COVID experience for us has been that students are now being forced to understand the visual media and how to make a video of themselves, how to market themselves, how to interact online virtually, and so on and so forth. And and I couldn't think of a better thing. If we have to suffer COVID, I'm grateful for that part of it because it, I've always felt like that's an undervalued skill set for musicians. And so they don't learn it and they don't do it. But now you all are learning things like what what a frame per second is, or what different types of file types are, how to upload onto different types of social media, yeah. what's the best looking background, what's the best looking lighting. I mean, holy cow, there's so many things that we're learning right now that we're being forced to learn that, yeah. that will be in your benefit, but you have to do it. You have to actually start posting uh, content. So I would love for you to talk to me about, I know you have a, a, a channel of uh, voice teaching type of stuff, but what else, no. what's, uh, what's going on? Well, and I wish it was more, I wish I had more time to do it. That's what's frustrating. It's like a free day like I have today, we're on fall break. So we have a break today and tomorrow it will be just filming content so that I can edit it and post it later. And I started filming some of the work I do with my students at school, but obviously, you know, I, I don't show their faces and you have to get a lot of permissions to make that happen. And sometimes when we sing songs that are still under copyright, YouTube will flag them. So you have to ask permissions and, and it can get a little bit complicated, but don't be like those people who just give up and walk away from it. It can have tremendous benefits if you'll just walk through and just go figure out how to get that copyright released and how to just carry on like there's nothing <laughs> gonna stop you. The great thing about this, about media, is that there's no middleman. And I can't tell you how like the rebellious part of me loves that so much because it seems like with performance, there was always that middleman in between you and your audience, that person who you had to sing for, who had to deem you like worthy of being on that stage in front of people. And, and that is gone, you guys, it's gone. You all know that Justin Bieber got famous because of YouTube. It had not, he didn't go sing for a manager. He didn't go do any kind of audition. He just put up stuff. So if, you're, if that's kind of your dream and where you want to go and you want to have some kind of attention online, you've got to put out content and I wouldn't be too precious about it either. Just give a genuine heartfelt performance and do one or two every single day. The more the better. One day, you'll never know what the market will love. Somebody will love it and start reposting it and reposting it and reposting it and suddenly you've got an audience that you can share with and talk to. It's just how many of you that want to will actually do it. I can't even stress it enough. Yeah. Uh, start making videos. Series. I would love to see uh, and tag me because I'll tag. I have like 1,500 friends on Facebook. Uh, tag. I'll tag everything. I'll do it all. I'd love to see performances of students on Facebook or Instagram or wherever. Um, uh, it's and, and I'll always be supportive of it. Um, because I know how scary it is when yeah. this past summer when my kids and I did a recording and posted it. And on Facebook, we, we ended up with, we're at close to 40,000 views. Um, uh, that, that's, that shocked me. And it scared me. I remember the moment before I pushed send. I was like, what am I doing? Should I, <laughs> should I share this? What if nobody likes me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
wasn't even that, but that's part of it, you know. But it's just, yeah. it's just a weird kind of moment in time where you're about to push, uh, that you're making the commitment that what you have to put out there is important. You've thought about this a lot more than I have. In fact, I've talked to you enough about it to know that if I ever have questions, I'm going to call you and ask you about this. But how do you set yourself up for success? What kinds of things are you considering to make your uh, um, videos immediately more successful? Um, well, and this is kind of a practical response to one of the uh, the YouTube creators that gives a lot of information about this. Her name is Sunny Leonard Doozy, and I'll write her name in the chat. I started looking at her stuff back in 2015, probably. I didn't even have Instagram at that point. That was new to me. I had been doing a lot of stuff uh, internationally, and I didn't know what this Instagram thing was, and then I found it, and I started looking into online creation because my teacher was not able to be with me at Yale. So I was able to do some, uh, not Zoom, but we did FaceTime back when I had an iPhone. We did FaceTime lessons, and um, so that was kind of my first experience with that, and then it became really important, and so I started looking into content creation, because here I am teaching all of these classes at school. Teach, I teach pedagogy, I teach, vo teach vocal lit, I teach all four sections of uh, vo vocal diction. Why could I not create an e-course, something that someone could download? You see them all over Instagram. People are trying to sell their courses, you know what I mean? Like sign up on my email list and blah, 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 to make some money. And you definitely can. And I'm in the midst of creating a, a diction courses for people to actually buy. But right now, I mean, diction, and you guys, some of you know that I am a diction coach, a dialect coach, sorry. And that was not, that's only been the last two years. And that's because I was interested in it and I was good at it. And I started to, to hone my skills and research and make sure I knew what I was doing before I go and try and train somebody and help somebody. And so now I've got these, these skills and I'm going, why could I not, how, you know, how can I distribute this to a wider audience while also being paid for that time? So that's where my, my kind of desire to look into this stuff came from. I didn't want to be limited to one person per hour because that's that's very limiting, right? I mean, if there are only 12 hours of daylight, maybe, and I start at 6 a.m., I usually have three clients in the morning four days a week because they're in either England or I have one from Australia right now. I have a little girl who's 13 in New York City, um, and, you know, that's three hours away. So it's it's if I'm up early, I can get to my first university student by 10 o'clock and it's okay and it's it's tiring but at the same time it's it's a way for me to make an extra income and I wasn't trained for that but I was trained uh, for that specifically but I was trained in how to assess pitch and sound and syntax and diction and vowels and gosh you could go into you could get a master's in music therapy with what you guys are doing I, any of you you could do music therapy, you could do um, speech language pathology, you could go, if you were into the doctor thing, you could go be an ENT, you could go be an, a vocologist, you could... There are so many things. One question that was on the chat asked how I picked Yale. Before you decided on Yale and how Gosh, I talked to a lot of people, I wasn't really sure what I was looking for, I just knew I didn't have a lot of money to go spend on it, and Yale offered a full ride. I, um applied to Northwestern and Rice because I wanted schools that had a reputation for being linked to big houses. And Northwestern, uh, Chicago Lyric was right there. And um, Rice was right next to uh, Houston Grand Opera. And I knew they had connections and ties. And I knew that Stephen King was a reputable teacher, even though I had no firsthand experience watching him teach. So I had not tested that theory yet. Yale, I applied for everything. December 1st was the deadline. And I had finished applying for all the other schools and like Ivy League, like there's no way, uh, you know? I'm not, and I was like, but I have all the stuff. I have all my videos, I have all of my essays I've written to, you know. And so I filled it out in like 20 minutes. I submitted it like 11 minutes before the deadline passed. I was like, why not? Why not? I've already applied to Rice where I wanted to go. Uh, what? Let's just see. And they, I obviously got a call back, but then I got sick before I went. And I wrote them, like, 
the day before I was supposed to fly out and I said, I can't come, I'm really sick. And I sent the email late at night and the next morning I woke up uh, my, with my phone, by my phone ringing and it was Doris, who's the artistic director of Yale and she wrote me and, and she said, Emily, what, how sick are you? Where are you? You really need to come out here. You really need to come and sing. And, and I was just floored by that. I just went, this is the stuff of dreams. This stuff doesn't happen. And so she said, well, can you come out in two weeks? I said, well, uh, sure, we'll see, like praying with all my might that I was well enough by then. And so I flew out, sang at about 80%. I was not 100% vocally, but they heard me. They knew they wanted, they knew they wanted it before they even saw me in person. They know. And so I, I had even gotten home from uh, Connecticut. I was driving on my way back to my undergraduate school and they called me, Doris called me and said, yeah, we want you. So it really, it really was kind of this last second thing. You just never know. I said, why not? And tried it. I didn't want to say no for them before I asked. I was saying no for them to me like before I even applied. And that's just not fair to yourself. So you, you've just got to try. So I think you, that was a big uh, determination for my uh, choice at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I applied in the uh, University of Arizona which was a recommendation from a friend who said they had a strong program and I went there and they had like 20 doctoral students. Oof. Sorry, the quality of education is not going to be good in that kind of situation. When I went to the University of Texas, I was one of four. Right. And, I, and that meant I had an ensemble that I was able to conduct for two years that brought in income and also gave me tons of podium time. And I was the assistant director. Yeah chamber singers that was there because he needed an assistant director yeah. so I ran warm-ups, ran all kinds of vocal technique stuff and taught parts. I mean it was literally baptism of fire. I, I was thrown into a very professional so true. situation and I, and I had to just suck it up and do it and I remember coming out of that and just being like okay this isn't as scary as I thought it was because I just had <laughs> to but every day I would get nervous and I would go and have to do all my stuff and, and, and every day it got less and less nerve-wracking and it's true and all that stuff Yale was every bit as scary as I thought it was gonna be <laughs> and then some but the great bit about it is it is that it wasn't that I became less afraid it's that my courage grew exponentially my the fear is still there you know but the more you're exposed day to day to that kind of stimulus, the more you get used to it. And I became braver. It wasn't about having less anxiety. It was about having being braver. Put so. yourself in those situations. That would be my recommendation is, is putting yourself in a situation where you have to be brave makes you stronger. And, 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 and I can't tell you how many times that little part of my voice, I mean, everybody has this voice, this little voice in their head that says, you can't do this, you're gonna fail. Everybody has that voice and putting yourself in a situation where you have to confront that voice and look at that voice and say, you know what, you're wrong. Um, but it takes, a gr but it takes so much humility, Tim, don't you think? Yeah. Like you, you can't, you're either run up against your resentment or your pride when you're like, oh, I'm not going to do that because you think you're too good for it or you think you're not good enough and you're afraid that people will judge you for it. They will. And maybe you're not good enough. Maybe you're not. And maybe your behavior is not taking you to the place where you can become good enough. And that's a difficult monster to, to face. It really is. It means you have to do something about it and it can be frightening. The good news is if you think you're alone in that, you really aren't. Like I'm so, especially on my Instagram, I'm so honest, you guys. I am very brave and I, I am just, I'm on fire when it comes to being afraid of things. I hate it. I'll just run right into my fear. I can't help it. I've been that way since I was little. It's just, sometimes to my own detriment, but you're not alone. We, you know, we talk so candidly about our fears because we want you to know that you're not alone and that you can do it still. If you have, if you have um, the humility to set the bar low enough to something that you will actually achieve, then you can take it little by little, like I said before. And it's, it's, it's a mindset that has saved me. I can't do this 600 page opera in three hours, but I can do one note. And I have the humility to say I, I, I'm not skilled enough to memorize that quickly, but I can memorize one note and one word and one rhythm in three minutes. I could probably do that. See what I mean? 
So just having the humility to, to set your expectations for yourself properly and then continue, 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 continue. But and that I takes some work. That, that goes for the other direction as well. Self-deprecation. There is a certain level, Emily and I have talked about this so many times, there's a certain level of confidence that's not ego that, that yeah. says um, that, that where it's almost considered to be a virtue a character virtue to say I'm not good at stuff, I'm bad at stuff, and to just sort of be defeated all the time. I tell you that is not a virtue. Uh, that's not something to to um, glory in or put up on a pedestal. You are good. You do have worth, but confidence is different than ego. And uh, and so that's I think a little what Emily's talking about. Setting yeah. those realistic expectations it is also about. Um, not letting yourself hate yourself or you know be um, critical but just be analytical what am i not doing well and and what should i what should i try to figure where out where can i start and you might yeah. start with a really simple thing like cleaning your toothbrush off after you use it <laughs> like things you can actually manage you know and you'll be amazed at how that sets up your day so differently i have a question okay aaron has a question <laughs> okay First off, Emily, I have to say this. My wife, Rebecca, and I absolutely adore you. Aw, thank Everybody you. Everybody in chat was saying, like, uh, we just followed you, Emily. We've been following you for two years, and we love your stuff, and you've been a great inspiration. <laughs> just a little sad note. But, just a little sad note. <laughs> but um, I am actually, I'm going as a BME, so I want to teach music, but I also have a passion to perform as well. And I know that you teach and perform. Yeah. So, what are your what are your tips and tricks to uh, like uh, like keep going in life and not get stressful? And like, how do you balance your performance and teaching life? What are your yeah? Well, I think it comes down to that fulfillment thing when you start to feel drained, and you will. Music education is is draining, and it's wonderful. And at the same time, the bureaucracy is real. Like, it's, you're going to run up against people trying to enforce different systems, like, every other month. And now you have to catalog this and report it. Now you have to catalog this in this perfect format. And now you have to... It's the stuff I, I greatly dislike about being in uh, public education. It's just, it can feel really confining. Um, yeah. I think that as far as not being burned out, that's only something you can gauge, really. I think balance is, is a swear word. I don't think it exists. <laughs> I really don't. I, I, how do I find balance in that? It's like, well, what does that, what does that mean? You know, you're going to have to define that really specifically. Balance, balance for me means being constantly on the border between chaos and order. That's balance because I want enough chaos to make me better. I want enough of it to, to, to force me to be better than I am. And I don't do that easily. I need some outside force to help me to be better than I can be. And I know I'm not everything I could be. I'm fully aware of it. And sometimes that, that is difficult. And other times that's exciting. And it means that there's so yeah. much more for me to do in this life, right? Because otherwise, what are we gonna do with our lives? Like you get into your 30s and you're like, I. Damn it, I have like 60 years left of this crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what am I gonna do? And so I think it's important to, to decide what that means for you. And balance doesn't mean not doing what people tell you to do. It means, how, am I, have I slipped too far into that chaotic place? And do I need to start saying no to a few more things that I have the power to say no to? And uh, I've learned that the hard way. Last year, um, it was weird because I was so grateful for COVID. I'm not, I don't feel that way right now, but I had so much on my plate that everything started canceling and I like cried with relief. I, I took on way too much and it started to be not fulfilling and not, not nice and helpful. I just, I started hating everything. <laughs> you know, my students, okay. thankfully I, I can keep it pretty well under the hood. They don't realize when I'm feeling angry and resentful and sometimes I feel that way when when too many people want too much from me yeah that's that's what I would say you get to decide music ed is so fulfilling I would just make sure that you you pursue everything that pr presents itself 
as being interesting to you. It might be something you can't even imagine at this point. You might suddenly take up a love for cycling six years from now and not even know. <laughs> but yeah, I would just definitely, ha we have an obligation to pursue those things, I think. Yes. Go, Audra. Okay, so, Emily. Hello. I have to apply to grad school by like December 1st and I have no idea how to narrow it down from schools. Like I know what I want to major in, but like because of COVID, they're not allowing students to come to campuses to look. So I don't know how to narrow it down. What do you want? To, what is your master's program? Vocal ped. That's really cool. So you're gonna do a master's in vocal pedagogy? Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I can answer a little bit of that. I would yeah. definitely look up the instructors and try to find uh, find articles that they've published, um, find what mm -hmm. their research is, and see if see if you find it interesting. You know, people who write well sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes are capable of talking well. And if you're looking for that mentor aspect of your degree program, that's a good yeah. way to do it virtually without having to actually meet the person. Yeah. The performers, look them up. Yeah. Find out what they sound like. <laughs> for sure. And you need someone who can articulate pedagogy very, very well. Very well. And without pride. Because I think pedagogy right now can be a very stuffy place. Uh, information is changing every other second. It's important to be up to date, but have a great curiosity. And you'll be able to smell it. You can smell resistance and pride on people real quick. So I would just look up, email them, find their information. People are not closed. They're not unaccessible. Gosh, anyone can email me and I'll be like, sure, let's Zoom. Just ask them, what is your program look like right now? What kinds of restrictions are in place? But just treat it like, like you're Googling something and watching a YouTube video. You are getting your, your money's worth. You can learn a heck of a lot by doing things online. It doesn't have to feel limiting. I've learned so much online, it doesn't bother me. The least, all my lessons with my teacher are through Zoom. They always have been for the last like two, two and a half years. So my clients are all remote, I mean, because they're in England, like how are we gonna meet up? Like we can't, right? <laughs> so so it's just it's just a part of it. I would go into it and fully expect, even though I don't think, obviously COVID's not gonna last forever, but I would go into it fully anticipating that that's just the way things are and we'll just adjust and it's about getting the information you need. So, so the I would notoriety look at that. Of, of the, the faculty, the notoriety of the program for sure, those are two things. Sometimes though that can create a level of, of Saturation. The yeah, programs they, get they, they saturated. Don't, they, don't treat, they treat you like you're, uh, you know, a peon, a low, a low life. Um, so you're looking for that balance where, um, you know, good reviews. Look them up on uh, my professor. You know, rate my professor. Yeah. Try, try to get as much information from as many different sources as you can. Um, but then also, I think what Emily said about them being open. I can almost guarantee you. That if you said, "Hey, I'd love to chat with you about your program. Would you be willing to Zoom?" That you, I, I'm almost 99.9% .9 sure you're going to get a response of a yes. And they'll um, remember you if you apply to their they school. They want people in their programs. Right now is a yeah. scary time for all industries where where people are seeing a little bit of a, a, a slope in attendance and uh, you know all of that. So mm -hmm. they're going to be excited for someone who's interested in their program and they're going to yes. treat well. I think. We want people who care. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many people have come in and sung well and have been my worst students because they're so prideful and so full of themselves and there's no room for discovery and they have massive limitations, massive problems that they don't want to address because they think they're too good for that. It's so frustrating. If I have somebody who writes me a couple times before, the, before they even come to my school and they're like, I want to talk to you about your program, I want to talk to you about music and I get a sense of how much they love learning and and just discovering new things gosh please come to my program you know i don't even hesitate they may even reach back out to you and be like yeah and if you're interested in this please here's an application here's you know we want to see people succeed that's why we do this work we want to help them so um i am kind of smacked up in the middle like i'm getting a performance degree but i also want to teach musical theater and so it's kind of like both um, and me and Warframe have definitely gone back and forth a lot on, you know, taking extra theater classes, extra music education classes. So I'm basically trying to get three degrees in one. Um, and so do you have any, like, suggestions on, like, what are the key elements I should be focusing on in order to succeed? 
And so your own personal studio, you want to teach yes. musical theater, vocal production style? Yes. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm, right now I'm getting a bachelor's in vocal performance and then a minor in theater. Um, but because of that, I'm not getting all the education classes. But I feel like I need a lot of those, like conducting, directing, you know, in order to yeah. do it, but I don't know. If you want to teach privately, musical theater privately, see, I don't, Tim, tell me what you think, because I know that a lot of the music education classes here at my school, I, I go and I look at them and they talk about ways to structure a classroom and ways to deal with certain behaviors, ways to um, kind of catalog your experience, but there's so much that they are not teaching. In fact, there, there are a lot of holes because you can't learn it until you start doing it. So if it were but me, think, it's like, just go start. I do think, so for me, I, I wasn't a music education undergraduate. I was a vocal performance undergraduate. But your wife was. But my wife was, and I'm grateful for that. She mastered a lot of that. <coughs> the procedural aspects of it. Uh, mm -hmm. More of the methods. The methods. Um, practicum classes and things like that. Those are all to learn those administrative uh, things. And yes, you'll feel a little bit out of place for a while because you're not learning how to do an assessment and how to build it. But I've learned all of that stuff on the job. Same. So it's not, uh, the only hard hardship is going into a job uh, audition and saying, I don't have this information as part of my, uh, and, you know, my, my certificate of worth, you know, my... Uh, but listen, I don't have an education to... I don't have an education degree at all. I'm a performer and I am the director of voice at a university because, because they point is, yes, that there are there are a lot of people who are not who are doing what you're doing a lot um, a lot and and so are you willing you know here's here's what I would say a music education person should be just as interested in gaining performance understanding and knowledge of how to perform just as much as a performer shouldn't leave the education stuff out of it. I, I really think that the performing side of it is more beneficial, but I'm biased because you can't learn it. You can't learn it in a classroom. And so you can't teach it because somebody taught it to you and you just hand down the information. When you have firsthand experience, you, it's power. You know. You haven't just learned from somebody else. You know exactly what it feels like to be on stage when the lights go down and there, you know, the, the set's about to come in and you're not thinking, listen to my glorious voice. You're thinking in three seconds, I got to back up past this mark so that the next thing that's flying in doesn't hit me. And then you, you know, it's not, it's not the same thing. It's, it's different. And you can actually talk about that with credibility. I think it's well, better. I just want to say thank you, Emily, for joining us. I'm grateful for, I think this was a great, you know, worth to, had a lot of worth to our, some of them, several of our students, and I hope all of our students took something out of it. But um, regardless, I love talking to you. You're awesome. You're my Love you guys. Don't tell the just hang in there, okay? <laughs> Have a good one. Thanks, everybody.